today's which word of the day, Sean, is a phrase. Ooh. It's yes, large of sorceresses. Oh. Um, so in the Witcher series, the books, the video games, and the TV show, whichever medium you feel like watching, um, <laughs> the Lodge of Sorceresses was a secret organization composed entirely of female mages and even referred to as a sisterhood due to no men being invited as the sorceresses... Sisses. <laughs> sorceresses. <laughs> That's a hard word to say. <laughs> sorceresses. <laughs> saw men as too incompetent to handle governing areas of magic. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. They are a circle or a clique um, who observe the current events of the world and try to influence politics. So they're like trying to get a a mainstay in in how the world operates. Interesting. You haven't even read that? Wait, what are you doing with the book? So he has the confidence to finish the story. Hear now the words of the witches. Welcome to Words of the Witches, the Charmed podcast that will guide you through the lesser-known published lore of the Charmed universe. In this night, and in this hour, we call upon our fanboy power! Bringing education and stupefaction to all of you. Together, we will use our knowledge and reverence abundantly, but also find ourselves sassy and delightful. Which is why we will truly be Charmed. Charmed. All right, <laughs> so welcome. That's my Linda Belcher there. All right, <laughs> you. Uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, this is Words of the Witches, spell worders, episode one hundred and twenty-one. Or if you're like a goofy movie, I to I. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm Kevin, your resident charmed resource. And I'm Sean, and I just love Zardok. <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> Who's Zardok, Sean? Don't tell us. We'll find out later. We'll find um, out later. <laughs> um, it's not a spoiler. It's just a hook. I'm trying to get people interested. Who's Zardok? What's going on? Who's Zardok? Who's Zardok? <laughs> Zardok. Amazing. This was really exciting. I haven't posted it yet, so maybe I'll post it before this comes out. But I went to a early screening of Never Let Go. And right when Alan was about to tell me she's not going to show up, we heard this, say it, say it. And we were like, what the hell? Why is somebody yelling? We're sitting in the theater. Somebody's yelling. Holly fucking Barry comes walking into the theater because she stars in the movie. She started high-fiving people. She started, like, taking pictures with people. She was so sweet and so energetic. And I told her I hated you a storm. <laughs> Did okay, you really? I made that last part up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was definitely a cool treat it was a good movie it's like i have some stuff about it i'm like uh, i don't know about that but it was a good movie and she's a lovely person yeah i love that <laughs> uh i had some encounters of my own this weekend i was at uh 90s con in daytona Ooh, i guess <gasps> by the time this Ooh. comes out it'd be a week ago but oh my gosh I mean, if you're a Charmed fan, you probably have been following all of the buzz, all of the things that have been happening that's been happening with it. Uh, you know, because Shannon was supposed to be at that convention. And um, I made a lot of memories this go around, different ones, truly wonderful moments, met a lot of, you know, life friends like Galen I got to meet, Brittany I got to meet, all these people in the Charmed community that I've talked to for a long time but never saw, Ethan Hinkle. So that was really nice. But the House of Hallowell live panel, Remembering Shannon, and there was also a vigil afterward that um, Troy from Australia organized. And both of those things was like the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced at a convention. Because, you know, we were there, we were being there with fans, interspersed with the cast, sharing what Shannon meant to us. And uh, all of us were feeling the exact same admiration and sadness together and celebrating someone that we loved. Um, and it was like, so incredibly special. I cried like a ton. Um, it, I, I didn't know I needed it as much as I did. Um, it was really everyone sharing their experiences, the memories they had with her, people who have both met her and people who have never met her still feeling the same things. Ah, I was just so moved. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping to do a bonus episode, um, soon just talking about the whole weekend in general. 
but that's something that'd be good. And I gave all of the actresses, I gave Jennifer Rhodes, Holly Marie Combs, Brian Krause, Rose McGowan, and Drew Fuller a copy of the Charmed musical script. And I uh, signed a little note in the beginning like, to all of them. Rose and Holly read it right there with me at the table. Holly started crying. I made Holly cry. Oh. Um, yeah. And I was like, oh. and uh, Rose was just like, I feel so seen. <laughs> she, she's like she's like yes this is exactly what i'm all about it's like thank you honey um and she you know she hugged me and then even at the vigil you know bk you know we're just right there brian Krause lit my candle and we're, short, we're lighting our candle to each other rose mcgowan hugged me at the end she's like thanks for being here kevin she remembered my name so i was like all right oh, wow um, yeah even jennifer rhodes from last night i saw her she's like oh there's kevin <laughs> <laughs> like, but, oh. so it's oh, really cool that is really cool congratulations it's such a cool Thank experience you. were they surprised that you wrote a musical <laughs> they were they're like what i even played some of them played some of the songs for them played the um angel's wings for brian and <laughs> he's like I mean, we took a picture afterwards he's like angel's wings <laughs> he's like, like that's crazy and he flipped and he, he landed around the elders are dicks he's like ha 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 he started laughing, started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very exciting. But let's get into this book. Oh, no, not yet, actually. I have a poll result. Uh, do you remember what the poll was? No, you don't remember what the poll was. <laughs> so it was, are you more romantic or more sexual? Because we had our love spells episode last week. Oh, yeah, I think I said I'm more sexual. Yeah, we both said we were sexual. Yeah. Oh. 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 <laughs> um, oh. Moaning. How do you feel the uh, results were? I'm going to say more people said sexual. All right. So let's see. So we're a bunch of uh, horny gays. Horny gays. <laughs> <laughs> men. All the men's are the horniest. Um, no. Uh, actual sexual only got 38%. It was 46 wow. votes. And then romantic got 75 votes, 62%. Wow. And I would think you know, all the women would say romantic and all the guys would say sexual. But no, it was actually pretty mixed, which is I hmm. think it's very telly, very nice. So, yeah. Interesting. All right. So now let's truly get into this book. We're starting a new book. Ah! I've been waiting for this book since we started this season. It's so excited. Um, this is called Totally Charmed. Actually, the full title is called Totally Charmed Demons, White Letters, and the Power of Three. And this is a collection of essays written by multiple people but everything was edited by Jennifer Cruz. So she gets her name on the cover, even though she almost wrote, like wrote nothing in this, she just kind of moderated it. <laughs> and she wrote the introduction and then the introduction to each section, that was really it, so. But she gets the title there. And, but we'll say who wrote each essay was, as we go through each essay. This was published October 11th, 2005. This came out near the beginning of season eight starting. You know, about season eight was about a month in. Yeah. So let's go over the cover a little bit. There's a lot to unpack with this cover. So we have, it looks like a, kind of like a tabloid magazine. It gives the illusion of a tabloid magazine. Yeah. <laughs> so this cover has kind of like, almost like a magazine stand pictures of the cast out and about. We've got Holly and Alyssa holding hands. Um, and I know what this picture is from. This is actually from the Teen Choice Awards in 2003. Hmm. The picture of Rose in her iconic, one of her iconic page necklaces. I don't know where the picture is from. I don't know where every picture on here is from, but I know a lot of them. Um, and then we have a picture of a little picture of Julian there. It says Cole Turner, romantic hero or misogynist pig? Question mark. And that picture is actually from when he was out and about with Shannon um, at like a um, Television Critics Association table tour in 2001. I remember them being together. Uh, up top, we have a picture of Alyssa from somewhere. And it says, what is she wearing? This year's best and worst dressed witches. <laughs> um, and then we have on the left, uh, too soon, it says better off dead. Update on Prue's afterlife and picture of Shannon. Oh, it's so weird. It's, it's so weird. And on the bottom, it says power of three cunt vanquish clogged drain. The Hallowell's plumber tells all. <laughs> That's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Um, it's a Ben Bella unauthorized books. Uh, so the back cover, uh, it says, it's true. Television show charms its way into viewers' hearts. Is it coincidence, luck, or just plain magic? Has Phoebe been raiding Barbie's closet or G.I. Joe's? Fantasy writer Tanya Huff tells all. 
And there's a picture of Rose. It says, the charmed one's tempted. Mystery writer Anne Perry gives us the demonic details. Scientist Robert A. Metzger uncovers underground experiments to create the ultimate witch. Are the men of Charmed out to sabotage their magical honeys? The rumors are true, says romance author <laughs> Maggie Shane. <laughs> um, it says, the power of three gives witches a bad name, claims real life witch Peg Alo Eloa, whatever, Aloy. <laughs> um, and then there's a picture of Shannon and Holly here. And it says, the alternative to Prue's death the show's producers didn't want you to see. Romance author Evelyn Vaughn has the scoop. Uh, and that's a picture from uh, Holly, of Holly and Shannon at the Ocean's Eleven movie premiere in 2001. I remember that. Um, this is under, underneath horror novelist Nick Mamata's shocking revelation. Wherever the Charmed Ones live, it isn't San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the like, overall back cover synopsis says, Charmed is a television phenomenon. Three gorgeous kick-ass witches committed to protecting innocence and cursed at finding love. In Totally Charmed, romance novelists, science fiction, and fantasy writers, and more, celebrate the hit WB show that has changed the face of the fight against evil forever. Ta-da! So, this section of the book is called The Sisters, and we'll be covering the introduction as well as four essays that were written kind of about each sister, and we'll break them down for you. How's that sound? Woohoo! That sounds great. Yeah. So, it starts off with the introduction. Confessions of a Charmed Addict <laughs> uh, by Jennifer Cruz, the editor. And after reading this, she pretty much just gives you her thoughts about the show. Um, she says, despite the Velveeta of it all, the cheesiness of Charmed, that she appreciates Charmed. She said she was drawn to like the power and the power of women. And she finds that the sisterhood in Charmed was true and sentimental. She really resonated with that. She makes fun of Dead Mom, aka Patty, for not having reverent thoughts, and then figures that makes sense because she was an, an adulterer. She's like, oh, yes, no wonder oh. why I didn't, I didn't like her. <laughs> She's an adulterer. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> I hate Dead Mom. Um, she also hates Grams, so it's really funny. She praised Piper and Leo as a couple because Leo's doofus personality went well with Piper's spineless nice girl thing. I was like, oh my gosh, do you like this right. show or not? I could not I tell. <laughs> she does have 110% have a girl boner for Cole. She can't shut up about Cole. I'm like, Get she over lost it. me right there. <laughs> yeah, so she's like way obsessed with him. She despises the leprechauns. She mentions the leprechauns all the time and how much she said they suck. And then she went on to talk about, she talked about the Seven Year Witch episode in particular. She's like, this is both the worst episode and the best episode. <laughs> She's like, I find the Seven Year Witch abysmal at best, but I also loved it for Cole and Piper's dynamic. <laughs> this was a roller coaster of an introduction for me. I'm like, what an introduction. Because she has very contrasting feelings the entire way through. She praises the show one moment, then bashes it the next. <laughs> <laughs> she seems absolutely furious about certain characters and episodes, i.e. leprechauns, but she does know that there's emotional truth throughout, and then she that's why she always comes back to the show, even though she hates a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, did you not see Wedding from Hell? Did you not see the Blue Moon episode? Why are you so hateful about these two episodes? <laughs> I know. I know. There's so many so much more to hate with but okay. Um uh, I will say she has a colorful way of putting things. It's entertaining, but I don't know if I'd consider her a major Charmed fan because there were times where I was reading this where she seems to genuinely hate the show. <laughs> yeah. It was weird. Because, yeah, it makes me think of X-Men, the animated series, the original. Like, yeah, it's got, like, terrible animation that can be laughable sometimes, but I wouldn't talk about it in the way that she's talking about Charmed. Yeah. <laughs> it's like she was saying things that she loves, but... It it seemed very irreverent in a lot of a lot of the time. So I'm like, yeah. mm. like, because I love Charmed and I can criticize it, but I wouldn't be like this, this crass about it. I'll talk about the canonical eras as we go essay to essay. So let's talk about the canonical era in this canonical. way. Canonical. Sean knows what it is. Tell us. <laughs> oh, you mean in like the first one, the name? Uh huh. <laughs> so <laughs> the writer went to go talk about Zanku, but he said Zardok. <laughs> Zardok. Like, what the fuck kind of name is Zardok? Where did you even get that? <laughs> so clearly she's not a fan because any real fan would get that name right. It's a pretty pivotal player in season seven. Don't even remember his name. <laughs> yeah. I wrote to Kevin today and I was like, I just love Zardok. He's my favorite villain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh gosh, it was so amazing. <laughs> I didn't realize I was in this first one already. <laughs> yeah, right in the introduction. Oh, wow. I'm going to read the, her introduction of this section. It's called The Sisters, The Power of Three, a uh, Four. The core of Charmed is the sisterhood of the Hallow women. But what takes that sisterhood beyond those mushy, very special moments? Please, somebody put stakes through the hearts of Grams and Dead Mom so they will stay dead. <laughs> <laughs> she hates them. Um, she does. Yeah, but uh, beyond those mushy moments is the beautiful, beautifully developed arcs that the characters experience and the equally well-developed arc their sisterhood has achieved over the past seven seasons. Their sacrifices for the greater good and for each other are heart-wrenching and real, and the maturity they find is hard-earned. The first essay in this book is called, They Killed Prue, You Bastards! <laughs> <laughs> A.K.A. Death Really Takes a Hallowell by Evelyn Vaughn. <laughs> Jennifer's little introduction to this essay says, As the kick-ass older sister, Prue Hallowell was first among equals. So when the actress who played her departed the show, the writers had a real problem on their hands. Evelyn Vaughn thinks they solved it just fine by remembering that some characters are so indelible, they're irreplaceable. So this essay first goes off with the notion that characters are not the actors who play them. You have to have a separation, which I think is very important because a lot of times we do attribute qualities of characters to actors and in some cases that's true sometimes they, they go together because the actor has to find something in them to make it work but there still is a separation okay uh i found this essay hard to read now you know after shannon's death um, because it talked about actors who have died in real life and then they said thankfully prue was a make-believe death and at the time yeah that was true and now it's just like oh oh it's hard <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it was made me a little emotional um, but then it went on to tell you routes the show could have gone after Shannon left like ways they could have done the show narratively uh, and I give you three options they said either Prue just leaves town which would have been awful because Prue as a character would never just leave never that was that would, it wouldn't make any sense for her character to do that <laughs> And the sisters wouldn't allow it. They wouldn't be like, oh, we just got reunited. Bye, Prue. See you later. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that makes no sense. And Prue, as a protector, as the as the mom figure, as caring and protective as she was, it never would have happened. There's mm -hmm. no way. And then the second option was someone else could play Prue. And the author was very surprised they actually didn't go that route. I was nervous back in the day that they might go that route too, but I'm like, I hate when that happens. I don't like when they do that. I always think of like the third mummy movie. I'm like, this is just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they, but they could have easily done this and they could have magically explained it. Charmed in particular is a show that could have probably gotten away with it because of the magic aspect. Like, Oh, you know, uh, it's like what they do in season five. My hair is red because a potion blew up in my face. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> but, and this is essentially what they did. If they, if they, someone else played Prue, this is essentially what they did in the comic books. Uh, yep, but if it was something they did in the show, it's I, I would have pissed me off. It would have I would have been mad. I think <laughs> it would be along the same lines as if they recast her, because we'd still be looking at even though we know in the show she's in a different body or whatever, we'd still be looking at oh she's not doing this like Shannon did or oh she's not saying that like mm -hmm. Shannon did. So exactly, it would still be very scrutinized. Right, and they said like they could carry on the essence of Prue, but yeah, we would totally be like oh this is a bootleg Shannon Doherty. <laughs> yeah because <laughs> uh, shannon no, forty <laughs> yeah because no one no one could have pulled it off like her it just no. wouldn't work um and then the third option is what they went with was prue really dies and she said this worked because of the love the writers felt for prue was evident they did care about the character and they did care about the audience and they said there's good three good things that came with prue really dying was that it was significant that she died valiantly she was mourned and it wasn't forgotten she was consistently mentioned throughout the rest of the series. Um, and then they didn't try to replicate her. Could you imagine if they hired a new actress? She's a new character, but she has all the same qualities of Prue and feels the exact same spot as Prue. That would just feel like a diss too. So yeah. they did all the good thing, all the right things. Plus I was going to ask you, I was yeah. thinking about this today and I've never mm -hmm. really asked you and I've never really gotten an answer, but I remember in season three, they laid the foundation for, um, uh patty was with sam 
So did they do that because there were inklings that Shannon might leave? Do you know? Is that why they wrote that in? Well, those those the Sam inklings actually started in season two. Oh, really early in season two. Um, that was in P3H2O. So oh yeah. And so that's when we first learned about the affair. That's when the letters come out. So um, I don't think they wrote that in planning for this, but the way that they tied it in, I'm like, it's so perfect. It makes sense. It was like it was almost like I don't know if they planned ahead just in case something like that happened. But I feel like they just put it in there and then they realized they had something that they could, you know, play off of. Yeah, because they wrote it in so early. It just, it was so natural. Like, of course, mm-hmm. why wouldn't there be an illegitimate right. child? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Charmed was very smart in that way. And I really do admire them for that. Mm-hmm. And I agree that Charmed respected the audience to know how much Prue meant to them. I mean, just think of how... I mean, so many pe- people like me mourned at the time and now even more knowing Shannon and knowing Prue. I, so many, so many people are moved. I, the, I've witnessed it's insane. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, yeah. And you know, the writers, they weren't trivial about the death, nor did they try to give us the same thing in a new package. It solidified Prue as her own person who we really got to grieve and we appreciate her for everything that she was. And we get to miss that. So while Prue dying sucked, a lot i do think it kept audiences invested and curious and um the death brought a refreshing energy to season four going forward which we'll talk about that when you get yeah, to the put page. a pin in that you're, yeah. you're like jumping on my yeah. lines I mean, but they, they go together it's like <laughs> i know, I know. <laughs> um but yeah doing this it also gave them the opportunity to see how history repeats itself crew even said episodes in season three and season two, that she was nervous about dying young, nervous about repeating the history of her mother. This just shows you too, like how the fears over fighting evil are valid. Like there are dangers to being a witch. It's not just going to be happy go lucky every time, which is, you know, stakes. Yeah. This one was interesting, but out of the essays, I thought it was the weakest just because it kind of pointed out some stuff that was like, Oh, that's interesting. But we kind of already know, you know what I mean? (laughs) Well, I felt the same about the last, uh, this one and the last one are the, exactly the same in a way. Um, That's true. Yeah. I mean, cause this was, it was nice to, to hear it, but yeah, we already knew all these things. People who watch this show already knew these things. I thought it would be more into, you know, I don't know, specifics instead of just generally as general as it was. Yeah. Uh, I did have another canonical ping in this essay. Canonical. Uh, they said, Pedro stated to be different from Prue by having red hair most of the time. I'm like, it was one season. It wasn't most of the time. She had That's one true. season of red hair, That's people. One season. <laughs> <laughs> but she she always gets like dinged of having red hair. Like she always try to put her in the comics. They try to draw with draw her with red hair. I'm like, hello. <laughs> she had dark hair for like three out of her out of her five seasons. Red hair and then strawberry blonde hair. So actually, no. Three and a half, because even the latter half of season six, she had dark hair again. So come on, get out of here. Get out anyway. of here. <laughs> Red hair most of the time. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this one, we were supposed to have a guest for this episode, and they were supposed to cover the second one. Did you want to cover this? Um, You cover it. That way I'll get the last two. All right. So this was The Ultimate Witch by Robert A. Metzger. Uh, and this is essentially the Piper essay. I like this essay a lot. Um, it's called, it's, it says, yeah. And so there's a section about how to build an ultimate witch. Uh, and it's essentially why Piper's powers make her the strongest witch. Uh, he says, and he's a scientist. So he tries to explain these powers scientifically. And if he's going to choose any power to choose scientifically, he was going with Piper's. Uh, he said molecular combustion is easily explained by science. It's a natural scientific thing that happens all the time. Explosions. But then he went on about his... Uh, her other part, molecular inhibition, he said. And he's like, this is more complicated to describe because it doesn't really make sense with science. If it's supposed to be inhibition, it should be like frozen stuff. But he's like, wait, if Piper, it, when she's good, explodes things by increasing molecular motion, based on what we learned from Bright and Gloom, when she was evil, she was a bad witch. And she has the true definition of molecular inhibition, which stops molecular movement and it crystallizes them, making like the icy cocoon whatever he's like yeah that makes so much more sense so that's why piper is balanced uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Uh, and then he went on. I talked about this theory called Maxwell's Demon. He's like, isn't it funny? It's called Maxwell's Demon. Is like a real demon and charmed. <laughs> um, pretty much that is the theory that t- takes, like, if you have a box of all these fast moving molecules and these slow moving molecules, it you can it like provides like compartments so that you can separate the, them. Even though they're in the same space, they can like be separated and isolated. So you'd. Um, put them into different compartments within the same box. And that's like a balance. And he says, if Piper realizes that she's like the world's biggest Maxwell's demon of them all, that she can take advantage of this to do more with her powers. And this is where it gets super interesting about how he explains how her powers could like be used and grow and evolve. He says things like Piper could freeze the air molecules into like a staircase and essentially do that to form her own, use her own form of levitation. Um, she could bend and reflect light molecules to appear invisible or project herself elsewhere, kind of like astral projection. Um, she could sever atoms and essentially slice through anything. So do like the Doctor Strange, like. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said with the right knowledge set that she could alter DNA, heal sickness. Yeah. And then he says she can cause a nuclear reaction eventually or generate wormholes through space and time. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, gets real, it got real out there so what are your thoughts <laughs> well first off i love the idea of the maxwell's demon box because apparently it was like a real box that this guy maxwell like came up with and like scientists are having problems like recreating it because like yeah like you said that he would separate the molecules so the slow moving ones would make icicles and the fast ones would warm up that's crazy to me that's that's yeah. witchcraft kevin that's witchcraft right. And half the box would be one and half the box would be the other. And you can be like, see it double. And that's pretty, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And what this made me think of is actually <laughs> back to Marvel. Um, <laughs> in Marvel, uh, Dr. Doom became God Doom because he like called upon the powers of the molecule man to mm. basically like give him immense power un- like unto a God. So yeah, this makes sense. So when I connected those two, like controlling molecules is everything. You could make anything, destroy anything. Um, even the wormhole, as crazy as it sounds, like makes sense that you'd be able to like make molecules take you somewhere else. So yeah, this this got me going. Like, wow, could you imagine if they like continue charmed with Piper realizing yeah. this power? <laughs> I know, it's crazy. I did find this essay kind of to be a breath of fresh air. Uh, strangely enough, because it's sciencey, but the author presents this hypothetical scenario, placing the reader as the lead, as like a scientist who watched Charmed and is going to like <laughs> discover the ultimate witch. But it was light and cheeky and a lot of fun. So even for people like me who know very little about science, I uh, can still be in it and entertained by it and, and be like, want to know more, which is cool. Uh, I did think some of his power theories were a little far-fetched they get really crazy but then again based on his explanation you you just keep finding yourself intrigued and almost believing yeah. it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i did have another canonical ping in this oh. essay canonical every, like every essay has like one canonical error so he referred to piper's base power as molecular inhibition on the onset and He's like feeling he was feeling like that doesn't make sense because molecular inhibition in science makes things freeze and it doesn't make sense because her freeze power is actually called molecular immobilization not inhibition she it is called molecular inhibition in bright and gloom which she refers to but it's technically a different power um even though molecular immo- immobilization means technically the same thing because it's stopping the molecules the key distinction is that there are no icicles formed in molecular immobilization so yeah if he went with what it's actually called, maybe he'd have a better time making sense of it. <laughs> That's true. And you know what's funny is that pinged something in my mind. I was like, molecular inhibition doesn't sound right, but I didn't know like why. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, she's freezing them, but not freezing right. them. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So we have an actually... essay. It's your turn. <laughs> yep. And actually, I found this one the most interesting. I have so many notes, Kevin. (laughs) So (laughs) many notes. Um, This one is called Will the Real Faibois Please Stand Up? And it's by (laughs) Jennifer Dune. 
And she gives a very, like, interesting look at Phoebe and kind of explains a lot of the things that I've heard myself included people kind of say they don't like about Phoebe. And that's kind of like, you know, her character doesn't always have the best story or the most mm -hmm. growth throughout the series. But after reading this, it kind of makes me, like, reconsider that. So some background. Jennifer's probably started watching the show around season three because she talks about watching um, reruns. She didn't watch from the beginning. She talks about how she always kind of knew kind of where she was in the series based off different pointers. Like, is Brew working at Buckland's or is she a photographer? She talks about um, where is Cole in his journey and his progression. But she had a hard time, like, figuring out Phoebe because she couldn't really see the growth as much in Phoebe. Um, she kind of talks about how Phoebe went from, like, a slacker in the beginning with a bunch of dead-end jobs to a housewife who looked after the manor while the sisters were away to a diligent college student to an advice columnist and then again to a student. And she kind of explains that Phoebe's constant in Charmed is change. She's the one who progresses the storyline, which is interesting because she talked about how Phoebe found the attic and the Book of Shadows. She unlocked their powers. Phoebe was this first one to say, like, we need to go help people. We mm -hmm. need to save innocence. She's the first one who really used her power. She's the one who like dove into the book more so and found that it could be used for more than just one quishing. Um, she also is the one who initially told the sisters like, no, you can live a normal life. Don't be afraid of your powers because our powers can also help us to, right. you know, fix whatever is going wrong. <laughs> I think what really made this interesting to me and what really got me into it is um, Jennifer applies the Myers-Briggs test to Phoebe. Right where it is so cool you like yeah it assigns you four letters if you haven't heard of it and they stand for something and in this one um she says that phoebe is an enfp which is extroverted intuitive feeling perceiver and that would be a visionary or a champion and this is kind of my proof because i told you from the beginning i see myself as most like phoebe after reading all this <laughs> i'm like fuck i am a phoebe <laughs> <laughs> so and this type tends to be a people pleaser they tend to bounce around to different jobs don't look at my resume until they find one that they <laughs> love uh, once they find a job they love they won't shut the hell up about it they just keep talking about how much <laughs> they love that job um they also tend to be truthful and find the truth they don't um have as easy of a time lying um, they fall in love easy, Phoebe, and tend to ignore or rationalize early warning signs such as, oh, my boyfriend's a demon. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they also tend to get hurt more by the relationship because they're processing things and making kind of excuses for things that by the time it gets to the point where like it's in their face, like you cheated on me or you're evil or this or that, they're like, well, fuck, I did all this work to make you last. And now you're, I you're know. <laughs> shitting all over <laughs> me. Um, they also attract an entourage and followers who see them as someone who can give advice, such as starting a column. Um, visionaries get bored easy and tend to break or redefine rules just for change sake that's very much me i love to figure stuff out and figure out patterns and we see that with the way phoebe writes spells more often i think than mm -hmm. the other sisters in the early seasons and she is more about potions um they're also uh <laughs> this is this okay this is me today kevin visionaries <laughs> are notorious for over or under committing committing i have so much shit on my plate today <laughs> i'm so <laughs> tired i'm such a phoebe so uh, because visionaries take on so much they tend to um overexert themselves and need a break from it all every once in a while so they go crazy also in relationships though they are notorious for over and under committing such as going head first into it being like this is the love of my life i'm gonna marry them when they're just like meeting them or just being like, oh, they're just fun. Or, you know, there's always a back door, such as like with Leslie, yeah. 
he was gonna he was a temporary so getting involved with him you knew there was a time limit same with drake yeah. he was One gonna foot's out the door when you before you get started you know yeah yeah and i have a very close friend who is the same way oh i'm gonna have a crush on this guy but he lives in london i'm gonna have a crush on this guy and try to be with him even though he's married even though it's supposedly an open relationship even though it's not so i've <laughs> i've encountered this firsthand um I also loved, I thought Jennifer was very astute. And I think she's the one who said that she actually writes like romantic fiction, mm -hmm. like supernatural fiction. Right. Because she took a guess on Phoebe's perfect love match for season eight. Yeah. And Isn't that amazing? Yeah. She said it probably would have to be like a scientist type of guy or like an intellectual who has less like social connectedness so that Phoebe could be the one to like connect the person to society and be that gateway. So of course we know that's not it's absolutely correct, <laughs> but like it's pretty damn close because it it's keeps pretty close. It, yeah, separated from society. He also hasn't been living amongst society. So Phoebe is that role for him and that's what made her stay. Mm -hmm. So very astute Jennifer Dune. It's such a cool essay, and yeah, I think pe more people realize this about Phoebe than that you know she might get more love. I love this because it totally justified how I wrote her in my musical. All of these things came true in my musical. She's always doing things that feel good, and she will inevitably try to escape conflict, which is why she kept you know distracting herself with these things. And you know, it's great. And they said that she would assign symbolic meanings to things that, in turn, may cause them to blame something else for their loss of identity. In you know, blaming Cole, blaming all these other people, blaming the baby that she has to have. It's it's so fascinating. I'm like, I realized all this about her without realizing all this about her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh. It's canon. <laughs> it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I did think it was funny. You talked about how she, Jennifer Dune wrote, like wrote short stories. In in the little description at the bottom, it says she wrote a short story called "Dancing in the Dark," where the lead in that story was obsessed with the character of Cole. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Everybody loves Cole so like, much. I was like, so now I kind of want to read that if there's a whole like charmed relation. Um. I do have a, have a canonical error in this essay as well. Canonical. Give it to me. Uh, and, you, you, and you brought it up. It says that Phoebe was the first to experience her power in Something Wicked This Week Comes. But that's not true. She actually was the last. <laughs> oh. So she did have a lot of firsts that she mentioned correctly. But that one, that was not one of them. Prue used her pen on Roger. Piper froze the chef more in the restaurant. And then Phoebe had a premonition. So. Okay, that's true. All right, tell us about the last one in this section. All right, this last one, I thought it was interesting. I liked it more than the Prue one, but you're right. It wasn't as good as the Piper and uh, Phoebe, but yeah. it's called How Paige Matthew Saved Charmed. And this is by Lee Adams Wright. And they wrote, whether you love her, or hate her, Paige was a much needed change to the show. Not only did she complete the power of three, but she helped new viewers understand the show. She also pushed the other sisters to grow. So it's pronounced Lee, right? L-E-I-G-H? Lee? Yeah. Lee? Mm -hmm. Okay. Lee. Lee. So Lee talks about how, um, I believe this is written by a female, but Lee talks about how her mom was watching Charmed and uh, <laughs> she didn't always agree with her mom's taste in shows. But she finally yeah. sat down to watch it on the premiere of season four. So she didn't know season one through three. But in having Paige there, she was able to grasp and like learn the rules of the game, just like how Paige was new to the game. So she talks about how like the writing around Paige was really good for bringing in new viewers. Because, for example, in Hell Hath No Fury, it simply just showed Paige reading an article on the persecution of witches, but this was enough to show us right away, like, oh, the witches can't come out because they're still persecuted. So without even saying anything, we know right away why the Hollowells are in hiding. Mm -hmm. um, she also felt that Paige represented like the otherness uh, to new viewers. So as uncomfortable as she might have been coming in and hearing them talk about Prue and lamenting Prue, someone that Lee didn't know about, she 
automatically identified with Paige in learning all this history and being a little confused at first. And she talks about how a lot of shows become stagnant around season three. <laughs> Lee uses a little known show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer nice. <laughs> <laughs> as an example. And it was a really good example because uh, the first three seasons of Buffy are the high school years. And I've never really thought about this, but yeah, to push the show forward, they had to graduate high school in season four, they go to college and sees season five through seven is, you know, more about adulting. And even like season seven, we see Buffy have to get a job and like be a part of society. So if they didn't keep it fresh like that and keep it moving, just like charmed, um, it would have gotten stagnant and Lee even mm -hmm. goes as far as saying it probably wouldn't have gotten to season eight without crew getting killed off and Paige being brought in to bring that new perspective. Um, she talks about how Paige not being strictly a Hollowell like Prue, we get a whole new dimension open up her being half white lighter, we get to see like half white lighter powers. And this was even I agree wholeheartedly. This is a good example of them kind of foreshadowing what if uh, Piper and Leo had kids, they're mm -hmm. gonna have half white lighter kids. So then we get to kind of go along with the ride and be like, well, damn, if Paige can do all this, what are the kids going to be able to do? What kind of shenanigans mm -hmm. are kids going to get into with these powers? It brings their relationship into the forefront a lot sooner and into question when we see a living, breathing white letter witch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, this was interesting. And I agree with you. It, it just reinforces a lot of what we already know about what Paige did for the show. I think it's a little more well written than the Prue one, but yeah, not as interesting as the Piper one and Phoebe's to my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Prue one, I was like, this girl watches way too much TV because everything she was referencing was like another TV show, another TV show. I'm like, yeah, Jesus girl lady. It was hard because they're all shows that like haven't been on for a while because this was written a little while ago. So I yeah. didn't really like identify right. with the shows being mentioned. <laughs> It said in her little bio at the end that she was a, a self-proclaimed TV addict. And I'm like, I believe it. But yeah, I was like, oh my gosh, how do you have the time? I did like, it was kind of, you know, if she is, this was a new person watching Charmed for the first time. It's no surprise that you would bond with Paige because she is kind of like the audience's avatar for a, a newbie. I like that she praised Charmed. She praises Charmed's ability to fill the audience in while keeping characters true to their own characters and not reinforcing things we already knew and in the white letter thing even the last name of matthews made her fundamentally separate and created a fodder for new stories even and even though um she was connected to the power of three there was still that that difference this is when we really get to see she talks about the growth of piper and phoebe because now piper has to be mm -hmm. the head honcho of the sisters and now phoebe has to be the moderator <laughs> right and that's something that Phoebe really is once uncomfortable with, which we talked about in her essay that she's like, I did it for a little bit, but then I went right back out and ran away. Um, so it's it's so it's so fascinating to analyze his characters like this. I love it. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, season four, everything was shaken up. So while this essay, I think it was nice to have the page appreciation. I didn't really find it necessary to say necessary because uh, everything I, after I read this, I was like, well, this is nice, but duh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, everyone who watched Charmed picked up on everything that was stated in this. Um, but I do like to think, like, you know, if there wasn't the shakeup, who knows if Charmed would have survived if the status quo remained as it was. It may have been canceled sooner. Um, because while we love Prue, you know, you know, how do you keep it fresh? Not to say they couldn't have done it, but it would have been a much harder feat without the shakeup. Yeah, I think they would have risen to it. They would have figured something out, yeah. but we'll never know. Yeah. And that's this section of the sisters. Do you have any like overall final thoughts about the section? Um, I see why you're excited about this because yeah, it is interesting to get other perspectives. It made me actually want to write one. Kevin, we need to write a book like this. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I would definitely write one analyzing um, 
uh, the queer audience of Charmed, like why oh, they yeah. identify with the sisters, what the sisters represent, how being a witch parallels being queer and having to hide from society, even though you're trying to do the best thing for society for the most part. I'm not speaking for all queer people, but for the most part, we just want love. We just want yeah. our rights. <laughs> I actually, I did read an article about that some years ago about like, why gays love Charmed or why gays relate to Charmed. Um, I wonder if I can find well, it damn. again. But yeah, there was a, there, someone did someone did write something about that. Uh, it was an mm -hmm. online thing, though. Mm -hmm. um, well, mine would have been written better. It it would have <laughs> absolutely would have been. Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, yeah, and I was so excited to reread this book. I was waiting for this, um, and after reading this first section, I'm glad that my hype was justified because it's so fun hearing how others interpret and analyze the show. And it gives you so much food for thought. I'm like, I'm excited to read the rest. There is, the, there, and there is a, uh, in the last section, there is a section of called the viewers. So they they address the audience more. I don't know, remember, I don't remember what it says in it, but they do. Um, hmm. I read one review for this book on the Amazon that said that they never watched the show, but really loved this book and couldn't put this book down, and it made them actually want to give the show a chance, <laughs> which is super weird. <laughs> Like, why would you read this show? If you because they, I guess they knew the basic premise, the overall like general stuff, but they never saw it. It's like, wow, I should probably watch Charmed after reading this. <laughs> That's so weird. I would never. It was just... so bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Like, why? Why would I read this thing then for the show I never watched? Okay. Maybe it was like written. Maybe one of their friends wrote in it, or maybe they knew someone, so they read it maybe. for them. Yeah. Yeah. So that I did all my canonical errors already. I said them as they came, so I don't have that. Um, do you have a tip for a future white lighter for this week? Oh, really just messengers? Guides? Think of us as guardian angels for good witches. Tips for tips future, future white lighters. I was out being a force of good in the universe. I do. I was very inspired by my Phoebe essay. Um, because when I worked as a trainer at Verizon, I had to study something similar to Myers-Briggs. Um, it was called something else, so slightly different. But, oh, it's called DISC, D-I-S-C. And you're a combination of all the letters. And depending on how much you are that letter, the more that comes out in your personality. Long story short, I am... Uh, someone who is very social doesn't pay attention to details all the time and very energetic but my high d is someone who is quick to anger which a lot of leaders mm. are a little more quick to anger the reason i bring this up is because the more you know yourself like literally when i was a supervisor i would tell my team if i'm ever like quiet it's not because i'm mad at you or if i seem like i'm withdrawn it's not because i'm mad at you it's because I'm stressed out and have way too much to do. And I get stressed out, I get quiet and I get focused because I need to get stuff done. So it allowed me in explaining to people why I am the way I am and why I act the way I do, how I could come off and like what to look for and how to like handle me. So I think mm -hmm. if we all kind of know that about each other, then we yeah. can better explain and handle ourselves. <gasps> That's so beautiful. You're so beautiful. Oh, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What a wonderful tip for life for future white letters. <laughs> <laughs> My tip this week is this is just a general overall in the narrative. If you have an opinion, if you have a theory, if you have any strong feelings whatsoever, share them, write them down, make a video essay, record it, do a blog. Um, because it will help you feel good that you're now acknowledging your own thoughts and, and you know, be proud that you had thoughts. Um, that's really good. And you could inspire others. So, yeah, don't be afraid to share your, your thoughts. Yeah. And I think just to piggyback on that, when you're passionate about someone, it brings passionate people to you. Like just looking at my experience with Solving for X with you, Kevin, because I'm passionate about X-Men, now I get a chance to talk to different people <laughs> from the show and different fans. So I've been meeting people and it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh, the wonderful world of podcasting has opened so many doors for, for both of us. And, you know, 
I think of those years where I didn't even listen to podcasts and just it was like, uh, I don't do that. And I was now it's like entrenched yeah. <laughs> in my life. <laughs> uh, so cool. Uh, so our last thing for today is the P is for a poll. Prue! Piper. You mean it's, it's just you and Prue, huh? Phoebe? Phoebe, you there? And a big hello to you too, Penny. Come on, Patty. The rest is up to them. Paige. My name is Paige. Hmm. Another P, imagine that. P is for poll. Uh, and our P is for poll for next week. This is cliche and basic as fuck, um, but we never asked it before, not to the audience. And um, I don't know, I'm just curious to see how this poll will go with our followers. Who is your favorite sister? <laughs> I mean, everyone should already know ours. Mine is Prue. Sean's is Paige, but then again, you might Paige. have Phoebe after this essay. <laughs> no, it's still Paige. I still love still my Paige. Paige. I think yeah. I was predisposed to loving Paige just because I already loved Rose McGowan, but yeah, and yeah, she's, she's got the rocker person, persona, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Prue and Paige. Uh, let's see how it ends up for next week. I'm curious. So in the meantime, Sean, tell us where we can find you. Well, you can find me on the aforementioned Solving for X with Kevin. This week we have Lenore Zan on the show. We're to interview her mm -hmm. about her new book that's out. So she's the voice of Rogue, if you don't know. So check that out. Check out my Instagram, Sean Perrett, where you can purchase the book Kevin Now Owns, which is Rue. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Awakening beautiful. And all my other projects. Woohoo! Yeah, you can follow me at my personal Instagram, kjeezy 8 uh, or this podcast at Words of the Witches, all the places except for the Twitter thing, which is Words of Witches. And yeah, yeah, buy the Trump musical if you want. I gave it to all the actresses, actors, you know that already. Um, yeah, so we'll see you next week where we still continue the rest of this uh, Totally Charmed. The next section is called their roots so we get to talk about the basis for their powers and their family and things so that's how it was cool. their hair after they dyed it uh oh yeah bruce is showing <laughs> <laughs> Ew. <laughs> <laughs> see you next week for those roots uh, your destiny still awaits bye, bye. <laughs>